Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 356 for Monday, Labor Day, September 5th here in the United States. Well, it's September 5th everywhere. It's Labor Day here in the United States. 2022! Folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about, for, by, and about, about, for, and by working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Hey, Paul, first of all, it's great to talk to you. It's been a couple of weeks. This is nice. I've missed yeah, you. We, yeah. Well, were you taking your son to college last week? Uh, no. <laughs> We we were going like that was that was part of the the plan it, that he is taking this semester off for a variety of reasons. Many of them have to do with the fact that his school didn't have teachers in the computer science department for him to take classes from. So kind of letting them sort and sift through that over there mm. while we're not paying them to sort and sift through that over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so no, he is, he is, uh, working and at the moment living at home, I don't don't know how long that'll remain, but, uh, but yeah, no, we did. We wound up not taking him. I, um, I saw a couple of bands this weekend. Uh, I saw Victor Wooten's Bass Extremes and Sole Monday, which is the, uh, drummer and organ player from Trey Anastasio's band. They actually had a bass player with them, uh, Desron Douglas, who is also the bass player in Trey Anastasio's band. Uh, but I saw them both at the same place, this new, relatively new, it opened last year, a place called Jimmy's Jazz and Blues Club. Uh, it's supposed to be a hot club. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Like like uh, Herbie Hancock has played there. Like it's a, it's a 600-seater, so it's not massive. And it's got a weird layout. There are spots in the club where the, the, you know, the view and the, the seats are great. And then there's like, it's like an L-shaped thing. I don't know how it would be being in like the side of the L that's sort of right next to the stage. It's like you, there's there's seats over there that couldn't see. So I'm not, I don't know. Like I didn't sit over there. I sat right in front of the stage both nights. It was great. It was amazing. Victor Wooten, uh, obviously bass player from the Flectones was where we first heard about him years ago and uh, and has certainly earned his own spot in the bass playing uh, Hall of Fame, if there is one. For sure. Steve Bailey is the head of the music department, I believe, at Berkeley College of Music here on uh, in Massachusetts. And they had uh, Dorico Watson playing drums with them. Fan- All three are fantastic players. I-, I never thought I would find a bass player who had the capability of upstaging Victor Wooten. Um mm. uh, but Steve Bailey, he played, Victor played his typical fretted four string bass and did all the amazing things that he does on, on his four string bass. Steve plays a six string fretless and, and there truly were moments where he was playing it like a piano. It, it, like there, there were things he was doing that, that were just spectacular and so musical and soulful and like really some great stuff. And the three of them just played so well together. It was beautiful. Yeah, it was it was really nice. It was it was really nice. Um, and Solo Monday was I I love the way Russ Lawton plays drums. I love I love anybody who plays a B three with a Leslie and and Ray is <laughs> is one of the best. <laughs> so seeing them play last night was great. But I also watched on Saturday uh, from my the comfort of my couch. I spent almost six hours. Uh, watching the mm. Taylor Hawkins tribute show. Did you watch any of that, Paul? I it just, it, it was really apparent. It was becoming a thing over the course of the day. The stuff that people were sharing about it. Got it. Yeah. Emotions that people were sharing largely about his son's performance. Which um, was toward was, the end, but yeah. 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 McCartney, you know, sitting in and, you know, it was, it was one of those things I didn't set aside time in my day to do it. Yeah. <clears throat> but as, as I was going about my life, there was enough stuff kind of, eking its way into my various social media feeds that clearly something special was going on. Yeah. I had carved out the day to watch it. I I have been trying desperately to get tickets for the one that's coming up later this month in LA and failing miserably. But, um, but I carved out my day to watch this. 
I didn't quite realize it was going to be six hours, but it, it worked out being fine. I, I I got chores done and stuff like as it was happening because I just put it on all the TVs in the house. But yeah. um, that first of all, the logistics of this thing were spectacular. I, I mean, every two or three songs were backline changes, bringing on different drummers, different you know guitar players, different whatever. It, 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 at times, entirely different bands and. The changeovers were maybe five minutes. Like it was, it was just, I mean, every, obviously everything was on wheels, um, but they really had it down for a one-off show. They clearly put a ton of work into the logistics of this. It was just spectacular. Yeah. There were a couple of highlights for me. The, the first that really blew me away was Kesha sang children of the revolution, that T-Rex tune. I had no idea that she should be fronting like an arena or stadium rock band. I, she was spectacular. I, 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 no words. Yeah. I had no idea when I saw it, it was like Kesha's coming out. I was like, okay, sure. Fine. Whatever. And then she started singing. It was like, okay, wait a minute. How did we not know about this? How did I not know about this? Obviously somebody else did, but, um, you know what's yeah. funny about that? Like, her, also, you know, like, I love Miley Cyrus. I just love her energy. Yeah. I just love her. Right. But it's funny because, you know, me being an old guy, mm. you just kind of think that the whole, that generation didn't come up paying their dues in garage bands and, you know, don't really know what that whole experience is. When you say she should be fronting a band, my mind goes to, I wonder if she's ever fronted a band. Did she just go from, was she handpicked by someone because she, you know, sure. had the had the you know right qualifications to be the next pop star put right into a studio with a bunch of loops right you know, like never seeing a real musician yeah 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 and did she just kind of pop out the other end a manufactured pop star my guess you, is you know, no she, i mean right? my, my guess no my guess is she paid her dues somewhere cuz she had okay. all of those skills i mean and like i i not for her but i've seen videos of lady gaga long before she went by that name Playing in, you know, play, like singing Zeppelin tunes. And plus. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that that was spectacular. And I hope we see more of Kesha. I guess my daughter was telling me she's kind of been screwed by her management in the past. So she may be locked into that kind of pop star bubble contractually, mm. maybe. I don't know. But um, my like Skylar was like, whoa, I, I'm shocked that she was able to do like there was some something that that surprised people who knew about Kesha that she was there. Um, then they played Wolfgang Van Halen came out, Josh Freeze on drums, Dave Grohl on bass and, um, Justin Hawkins, uh, uh, singing, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Wolf played guitar and I, I am still blown away by how effortless, like if he needs to learn one thing, it's that trick where, when you know you can play a part, like a technically difficult part. You have to act like it's harder than it is for you. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like, he was just smiling and playing all these Eddie Van Halen licks that, you know, his dad had created. Like, without even thinking about it. It was just like, wait, what's going on here? I, like, first of all, I didn't know he could play guitar like that. And second, I didn't know that he could be, play guitar even better than that. Because clearly he can if it's that effortless for him to do what he just did, especially like hot for teacher, like that's, you know, he and Josh freeze the drummer. You have to be totally locked in on that. Otherwise it's a train wreck, right? Cause it's yeah. too fast. And there's all those syncopated things together. And it was just like, yeah, Hey, he would just turn around and look at Josh and they would just like play the runs together and be like, cool. That was fun. We should do that again. <laughs> like what the hell's going on here in my life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sweat a little. Yeah, right. That's it. Yeah, sweat a little. That exactly. And there is something to be said for that. Like the showmanship part of it of saying, I know I'm about to play, watch this. You're about to think I'm playing something super difficult. Right. And and <laughs> like selling it is as much a part of the show as actually delivering it. And sometimes even more so than delivering it, you know. <laughs> but um yeah, it was really it was an interesting thing. Um and then, then things kind of got got sort of weird in the middle. I was excited to see the James Gang until I saw the James Gang. It was kind of a train wreck all the way through. 
Uh, yeah, you know, whatever. I mean, they, the band hasn't played in decades, right? They they literally got back together to do this show. So, okay. To the best of your understanding, is there is there a dotted line connection between all the all the acts that oh, participated? Oh, a hundred. It, there's not even a dotted line. It was a a a woven line. Dave. What's Gro- Kesha's connection? She was friends with Taylor. Ta- that's the thing. Is Taylor Hawkins? Everybody that talked about their friendship with Taylor was like sp- they they knew this wasn't true, but they spoke as though they were Taylor's best and only friend because there's no way that Taylor had time for anyone else, given how much time Taylor dedicated to the fr- his friendship with that person. And that story got told over and over and over again. Like he he was cl- very clearly a special human in addition to just being a, a great drummer. Uh, and a and a and a presence on stage, it, you know. He he was a good friend to all of these people, and everybody was selected because of their connection to Taylor. Yeah, Stuart Stuart Copeland played uh, next to you, and every little thing she does is magic. With essentially with the Foo Fighters, he was just a drummer, and you know the Foo Fighters played. Dave sang next to you, and then Gaz Coombs from uh, Supergrass sang every little thing she does is magic because obviously Dave couldn't sing that uh, well. But um, and then uh, Getty Lee and Alex Lifeson came out, uh, which was kind of the thing that made me decide I needed to watch this thing. And they they played, well, you know, big Rush fan. But also this wasn't able to happen when Neil Peart died. Right. This was like because Neil died in January of 2020. There were plans for things to happen, you know, that spring or summer. And then I I don't know if you remember, but there was this thing that happened in March of 2020. Yeah. Uh, and so they played 2112 Overture and Working Man with Dave Grohl on drums. And then, and I hope I don't choke up here telling this part of the story. Um, but if I do, it's okay. Uh, and then Getty explained how in 2008, Taylor's management, whatever called Rush's management, got in touch with Getty and Alex and said, Hey, it's Taylor's birthday. He would love to have you come and play YYZ, uh, or as they call it, YYZ with, uh, with them in Toronto where they were playing. And so Getty and Alex went down and played that song with him. And, and he said, so we're going to, we're going to play this today. Uh, it, both as an honor to, to Taylor, but also to, you know, our fallen brother um, who they had yet to really kind of publicly mm. do anything for. And as they're saying this, I'm thinking, well, Dave's a, Dave Grohl's a fine drummer, but he's not going to be able to cover YYZ. Like, there's no way that, like, ta- <laughs> Taylor could play that, obviously, but, you know, Taylor was a much better drummer than Dave. And not that, again, not that Dave Grohl's a bad drummer, but, you know, it's just, I just know his abilities. And I turn, yeah, it's just yeah. not the same chops. And, uh, and then as, as they kind of zoomed out, it, they had switched over and Omar Hakim was back on stage to play YYZ with, with Rush and he, it was interesting. You know, he's a very funky drummer. He has a, a lot of groove. He also looks like he's about 35 and he's 63. So I want, I want, I want to learn some of that magic, but, uh, yeah. but it was, a, it was, a it was, he did a, he did a fantastic job. It was different. You know, he, he like, he can't help, but turn the verses into a groovier thing. Uh, but that was cool. It was, you know, I mean, it was, he, he was playing the drums. But um, it sounded sound like it was just an amazing tribute. And, it it yeah, was. It was fantastic. On so many levels. So, yes, it was. It was a fantastic thing to watch. And halfway through it, my wife was like, you know, I don't really even feel guilty sitting on the couch and watching this. And I said, listen, if this show were to happen in Boston, uh, we would just be there sitting and watching this. So it's all it's all fine. We just get to couch tour it. It's totally good. So totally good. Yeah. But it was good. Yeah. It, it, um, Travis Barker played. It with the foos for a little bit uh, in their kind of end of the show set. He did great. Um, Omar Hakim played again with the foos. And then obviously Shane Hawkins, Taylor's son, as we've all heard, played, uh, played for one tune. He did a great job. He like, he did a great job. It was interesting watching him and that, that girl, that younger girl, Nandy Bushnell, Bushell, I guess um, the drummer that had challenged Dave Grohl to a, a drum battle. Uh, on the internet, you know, whatever. I think it was during COVID lockdowns or whatever, but she was out there and played with them too. And the two of them did a fantastic job, but each of them had a couple of moments where sort of coming out of a fill or a transition between a chorus and a verse or whatever, uh, there was a little bit of a hiccup in the groove and it was fascinating just watching the Foo Fighters just play as though nothing happened. I mean, which, which doesn't surprise me. I mean, 
I, I like that happens to me occasionally too. Like it happens. I think it happens to any drummer. You know, you like you lose focus and there's a little hiccup and the bands, you know, pros are used to like, okay, that's fine. Don't, 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 don't let it happen again. You know? <laughs> so, um, but it was good. It was, it, yeah, it was, it was special. And I'm, I'm glad cool. I, yeah, I'm glad I got to see it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <sighs> I got some, uh, how have gigs been for you? Um, we just finished a, a month. We had two, uh, every other, every other weekend in August, we had a run of, I had a run of four or five days in a row. Okay. And the band played, the band played three of those of five in each week. And I would say, you know, we, we had some pretty good moments in the, in the last one. It kind of feels like, <clears throat> kind of feels like those runs are what we've needed to kind of lock in. And it's just so different from what we were playing every weekend in past in past years, you know, 10, 12 gigs a month. So it was good. That's good. The band the band was clicking and you know, I, I think it'll be interesting to see if it stays because we're gonna start slowing down now and it'll be, you know, interesting to see whether that is sunk in. I, I our band is like really slow starters. Like like huh. first songs are always worrisome to me. You know, we just sometimes I try and get a you know real high energy one and you know, it's especially a slow starter when there's no energy from the crowd. When we play a festival and it's, you know, a hyped up crowd where we hit, it's usually, it's usually fine, but just opening a slow show and just trying to get our, our legs, it always feels to me like it takes three or four songs before we're kind of into our groove. And I, I don't like that very much, but, and it's a, it's a band wide thing. It's a, yeah. it's just like a tentativeness that, that, uh, the combination, of all these psyches together seems to put together, but, um, that's interesting. The last of the gigs that we did was uh, an audience. Uh, it was like a, it was a private schools, like a concert for the private school. And a lot of people were there, but a lot of people set up their lawn chairs with their backs to us in a circle. You know, they were there to socialize with each other. And I think we were not prepared for the concept of being background music for this. And we had a high energy set plan for him because it was, you know, it was billed as a concert. Right. And um, it just took a while for us to find our groove. You know, th then the first, you know, first couple comes out to dance and maybe six or eight. I, we always talk about, you know, what's a professional. I really, really think that one of the things that needs to be added into the conversation, dancing is not the only litmus test. Correct. Like, you know, can, you know, it, it is, it is, unless you're a dance band, I guess, unless you're, you know, that's your job is to get people dancing. But, you know, there are so many situations that even dance bands, you know, have to have a good plan for entering you Con know, strategy. concert mode. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, lis listening room mode is, is what I th kind of think of it as these days. Cause bitter, bitter pill winds up playing two different types of gigs. We play the high energy, you know, sweaty club kind of thing where everybody's just like rocking and up on their feet and whatever that turns into. And that's great. Like, I love that. But I also love when everybody's seated at a, you know, coffee table or in their seats at a theater watching us. And, and we can like, I can't agree. I agree with you so much. I yeah. mean, it is, it is a different set of skills as a, as a performer, as a musician, if you are, if you're a musician, cause you want to communicate something about life to other human beings, which is probably at the core of maybe, you know, a lot of people get the juice off of, off of doing it live. A lot of people get yeah. the juice off of recording something that then goes out into the air. But I mean, if you're a musician who, you know, part of your reason that you are a musician is that your lifeblood is the reaction you get. Dancing is one measurement. And for so many cover bands, you end up in a in a in a situation where that's the scorecard, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's and, a rut, you know. But it, but it's, I mean, trap. It, yeah, it it's how that works. I get it. I've played in those bands where it's like, okay, you know, we've navigated a path where our job is defined as keeping people drinking and dancing, in quite frankly, in that order, right? It, you know, and that's fine, uh, but. It's not the litmus test for every band. And I, 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 t even to your point, I, I agree. Even a, a band who is mostly doing that, if you can get a gig that people want to sit there and watch you play, th that's fine. Like you, you need to be able to, to adapt to that. And it, it's interesting as we're having this conversation, I'm thinking about not the beginning of the gigs is what comes to mind, but you know, the, the middle of the last set kind of thing when it's that, 
you know, dark, sweaty dive bar club, you know, whatever it is where it's just everybody, it doesn't have to be a dive bar, but you know, the, the everybody's up and it's, 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 there's, it, it's frat party mode is what I think of that as right. Where it's yeah. just like, it gets a little sloppy out there. We can afford to get a little sloppy up here on stage and we're all kind of in the same thing. But I think about the band and yes, we can we can like join that sloppiness or or, you know, sort of make that a part of the thing. But when we're in, you know. Listening room mode, we don't mm-hmm. get sloppy like that on stage, like it's a very different. We remain energetic. Okay. We remain engaged with the crowd. You have to. And that's a hard thing to do. If you're not used to doing that with people who are quiet, uh, but it works and it can work really well. So, but, but it, it's, it, it takes practice. You just have to, we've, we generally. Well, it's a different, it's a different aspect of always be performing, right? Right. I mean, right. The, you yeah. know, the, the weekend warrior cover band thing in a bar, again, the litmus test is often, you know, did you get them dancing? Did you, you know, therefore, are you, are they having a good time? Therefore, when they're not dancing, are they buying another drink? And, you know, it kind of, that cycle feeds itself. But the ability to make people feel something in a kind of a concert setting, and we can, we can call that anything. Or, like, sure. I love my coffee house gigs. I'm paying, I'm playing to maybe 60 or 80 people. It's pretty small and intimate. And, um, you know, all those chairs are facing me. It is the most, and it is, it is as invigorating as when the house rockers play for 5,000 people. Sure. I mean, literally feeling the juice of every eye in that place is on you. And every choice you make is, is part of the experience that you're going to give to these people is that's just thrilling to me. I mean, that's not for everybody, but that's just really, you know, thrilling to me. I was thinking about some of the pictures, you know, our, our uh, friend, Mike Shelty and uh, yeah. pork tornadoes, right? Yeah. They play some pretty big gigs in Iowa. And, you know, they take a lot of pictures of gigs and it seems like, and maybe it's just different in Iowa than it is in California. But um, like when we play festivals, the front in front of the stage always turns into a dance floor. I mean, people dance, right? But it looks like, and they're playing to some pretty big crowds and it looks like they're entertaining in a concert mode. So they've kind of taken the the cover band genre and they've turned it into a con- concert experience. Yeah. That, you know, clearly works. I mean, they work a ton. They sound great. They look great. I mean, it's, it's a cool band. Um, but clearly, you know, that they're, they either they've broken out of it or their area isn't as much, you know, maybe it's just a bunch of people who just need that live music experience. Then it's not just about dancing. It's about smiling and singing along and, you know, feeling your blood run. Yep. You know, it's just a different thing, but it's kind of an interesting question for anybody listening. Like, is your band good? at non-dancing venues like do, like do you guys deliver the goods and give people a quality experience or does your band get kind of tight when it feels like oh nobody's buying into what we're doing nobody's dancing which you know i can say definitely i felt that in some vibes that you know over the years where, where our band has been it's like like why aren't they dancing what's going on you know and sometimes it's not until the second set like this we did a gig last week or two weeks ago first set really hot People sitting, people socializing, people finishing their wine. Second set, as soon as the sun was down enough and the wine had taken hold, <laughs> but, second, yeah. second set was bananas. Yeah. You know, and it was just fun. And, but again, it was fun as people, you know, we play dance music. So, you know, it, 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 again, there's not a black and white to any of this type of stuff. I, but there are, we all experience places where the venue is not conducive to a dance party. So that, no. Are you, yeah. are you good at that? Yeah, I think, I I think, you know, going back to what you were saying, because I've certainly experienced this with bands for myself uh, many different ways over the years, that whole, we come out and we're tight, not tight, like, like in a good way, but yeah. like, you know, like, like, but we call stiff, it butthole tight, stiff, butthole tight. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it's stiff. And I think a lot of it, the, the I'm thinking about the gigs where it's not that way, but yet it's that same type of crowd, the, the quiet crowd that's just watching you're under a microscope. You know, it's not like there's a party out there that we're joining. They sat down and now it's showtime and all eyes are on us and everybody's paying attention. And if and that can be super uncomfortable and it can be where it gets mitigated is the comfort of having played that way many times and 
for all of us in, in Bitter Pill, we have experienced that in a variety of ways together and separately in theater where, you know, even if it's a high energy musical uh, or, or play, although I've never done plays, but some of these people have obviously it like the crowd is still quiet. It, it's how it should be. There is no talking amongst the crowd in that environment. And so you get used to coming out and, it being about you in that in that sense, right? When it's a when it's a dance party and the party's sort of already going and all that, the party's not quite as much about you. You know, you're there to add to the party, but it's not like okay, and now the show begins, right? So, yeah. like the party's happening already, and it's super easy to st to get up on stage and like amplify that party. But if it's not, then you just have to be comfortable coming on stage, engaging a crowd that's quiet talking to them, not just staring at your shoes and being like, okay, well, if we play a couple of songs, then maybe they'll warm up to us. No, no, no. You have Your to, job. you have to be the first one to warm up to them. And then they, they want to come in. Like, look, they're there literally sit, sitting and watching you. It's not like they're doing anything else. They've already showed you that they want to be there, that they want to see and hear you play. So come out on stage and thank them, embrace them, acknowledge them. That it's that's I mean, I say it's that simple. Well, this is this is the this is the Uber always be performing. It's really, yeah. you know, creating the vibe where everybody can get what they're there for, right? Mm -hmm. So so if they're there for a listening experience, what what are you gonna do to make sure that they get the best listening experience? Yeah. You know, and you think about it, you know, in the cover genre, sing alongs are good, you know. Even in the original you know, genre, I, I mean in the live music genre, sing alongs are yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know telling stories about songs, you know, something that connects the audience to the performer, anything that connects the audience to the performer. And it's, you know, we talk about truth is the, is the ultimate thing, you know, like if you're not silly, don't be silly as you're trying to force this vibe onto people. Right. Yeah. If just be you. you know, yeah. You be you. Right. That's it. And, and that to me is the stuff that makes those like, it's interesting. I've been to places where bands have been fighting those first set blues, you know, of, of, you know, feeling like they're not going over and the front man starts saying some stuff that, you know, come on guys, you know, <laughs> it's anything, you know, that, that he's not, he's not handling it well. And, and then the band is getting tight about it because they're feeling the, the reaction to, you know, not being led in a very way. And, and, you know, it just creates some awkward moments. But then the flip side of that is seeing the bands who are really polished and sometimes it's just plowing ahead and just doing your thing and letting the music yes. do the talking for you. If yeah. you're good at that, if you can do that. If and that's sometimes. Like, but it's, it, you know, I saw somebody, I think it was uh, Todd Suckerman from Styx uh, was saying, it might have been somebody else. doesn't matter. The lesson is true. He's like, look, you have to, as he was speaking to drummers specifically, but this really is true for all performers. You have to play with confidence. And you yeah. have to perform with confidence. You know, Todd was talking about it specifically in terms of the drummer's relationship with the rest of the band. If you've got a drummer who's hesitant and wondering and all of that, like the rest of the band's going to be oftentimes just like stumbling on their feet. Like what's happening here? You need that, yep. that rock. And, and that's a really interesting thing to navigate when, you know, like I'm a sub somewhere and I literally am the one on stage that knows these songs the least, but it's like, the parts I do know, I have to play with confidence, right? It's like, sure. even if I'm wrong, I, like, even if I'm wondering if I'm wrong, I can't show that, right? But that, that translates further out. Everybody has to, if, if you come on stage and act timid, unless somehow that is your vibe and you figured out a way to make it work, in which case I'm guessing there's more shtick than reality there. But again, that's fine. If that's your, if that's your vibe, great. But otherwise... You don't want to go on stage and be timid. No one came to to watch a performer who's uncomfortable performing. And maybe that's what Do it is. Do you remember the first time we when we did the Macro All Star Band when we played with Tom Irish? Yeah. Yeah. And Ron Holloway remember, even like, played sax with us, right? Yeah. Well, do you remember that we had no idea what Tom, how much Tom was into the mix stick, right? Yes. And he came out on stage and he just he was it was He became Mick he Jagger. Was Mick. Yeah, and and it and it bought the, bought the whole band in. It bought the whole audience in, and the and the and the he was so committed to it, it took the level up to another thing. And again, it wasn't 
shtick. I, that's I mean, the wrong it, word. It is shtick, he, but it's his. It's but his. He act. loves Mick. Correct. I mean, it is. It, but it, it's so clear. It wasn't a parody of, of. It was a channeling. Correct. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. He was. He was playing a role. Uh, on is what he was doing and it, it like in a in a very convincing way that it like you said it convinced us it convinced the crowd it it added energy and it was not yeah it was not tongue-in-cheek it was i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna go all the way and it was great and you know those, those were kind of interesting gigs because you know we were playing at tech trade shows which is going to be eight eight guys for every two girls anyway so they were not dancing gigs and so that i guess that's kind of a embodiment of what we're talking here like we just went out you know very little rehearsal and we just played our butts off and you know we knew that those people in the audience were our friends and co-workers and yes. you know there was a connection there there was a lot of eye contact there was a lot of acknowledging you know friends and and you know the moment and you know how much we enjoyed preparing to do this for people there was just a great yeah, we holistic were, exchange of goodwill it was a party i mean it was it was kind of a softball for us right because it was it was a party of friends <laughs> yeah. and who were Gonna have a party whether or not we were there. To be perfectly frank, right? Like that was your whole. But you idea. know, what? even when we went out and did that gig for that um, Mac thirty, what was the one that we did at the De Anza Center? Oh yeah, we did at the at the Flint Center. Um, that wasn't a softball. That was that actually was, kind of an intimidating thing. That right? was super intimidating. But we had played together for like fifteen years by the time we did that. <laughs> that wasn't gig but it was the same one. vibe, and people came up afterwards. And yeah. Even though, you know, it was a huge stage, huge room, yeah. it was a big, big theater, um, you know, people came up and they got, we just did our thing. There was a, it was a little bit tense in the beginning until we, you know, could be sure that we heard. But once we kicked into a song and, you know, we were feeling comfortable, yeah. it was the same kind of joyful thing of a bunch of friends playing together. Absolutely. And nothing was said, but we just did our thing. And then a bunch of people came up afterwards. It was like, that was really cool. We really enjoyed it. I added a lot to the evening. So just intuitively, we kind of went to that place. We're like, you know what? We're just going to do us. We're going to do our thing. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. I. Uh. I just finished with a fling rehearsal here. So I. Well, actually, I. I want to. I'll tell this story because there's some interesting things. But um, I'm curious what you folks do, and how you like how you approach going on a stage where it's not. Like the room is not already in party mode and the room is in, you know, when you take the stage, they're going to quiet down as opposed to get louder. Right. Like that's the, <laughs> that if, the if there's a comparison here, it's that. How do you how do you make sure that you get out there and deliver? What what are some of the tricks that you use that, you know, you can rely on to, you know, make yourself feel more comfortable and therefore make the crowd feel more comfortable? Feedback at right. giggabpodcast.com. I'd love to love to hear. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I just finished a fling rehearsal, like literally 10 minutes before we, uh, before we started recording here, we've got a gig coming up, uh, next weekend, I guess. And if it, the fling is like firing on, musically firing on all cylinders. And I mean that f both for our, our live set, but also the recordings that we're putting together. It's like, there's a lot happening with fling in that regard. And, uh, and it's great. Everybody in the band is super focused on the direction we're going, the, you know, really kind of re uh, recreating fling as an original band. Uh, it's been, it's been wonderful. There started to be some conversation in our fling. We have a little Slack group as I know many bands do uh, about, okay, Hey, look, you know, Aaron, our keyboard player, the way his life is, he can only commit to one gig a month, essentially. Uh, and so, there was some discussion about, all right, well, should Fling be ready to play as a four piece without Aaron? And in the past, we we had tried that and it just didn't work all that well. We have a new bass player who is a also a fantastic singer, both lead and harmony. He he's also a great front man. He comes from the theater world. He understands, you know, all a, a lot of the things that we just talked about. In fact, probably getting Jamie's input on that might be really helpful. But um, <laughs> now that I think about it, uh but there was some discussion and it was like, gosh, it's too soon for, for me to, to know how I feel about us gigging as just that four piece as opposed to our five piece. And I'm like, it, it's possible, but I know in the past fling is better as the five of us than, than less than the five of us. And so we started having this discussion and as we did, uh, starting to sweat a little bit thinking, okay, wait a minute, like, uh, 
I'm, I'm in two bands right now, two original bands that are pushing forward, Bitter Pill being one, obviously, Fling being the other. And am I navigating myself into a scenario that I might have like some logistical scheduling issues if Fling really starts to heat up? And as this conversation evolved, everybody in the band started to kind of come around to this idea of like, well, wait, how often do we really want to play as Fling? And the once a month thing seems to work really well, especially where Fling is right now. The number of songs that we have, we can play two sets. Fine. You know, more than that with originals would be a stretch. I mean, we have plenty of covers we can fill things in with. That's fine. But you know, we're always going to be playing the same originals, at least right now at, at every gig, if we're doing a two set night. And so everybody was like, well, why, why do we need to do more than Aaron can do? Like, let's let, let's let that be the limiting factor because I think that's about where we should be anyway. And it was like, Oh, whew. Okay. Like it didn't have to be me. Like I, I would have felt bad, you know, saying, Hey, look guys, I can only commit so much here. Uh, you know, but it, it, we all kind of came to this consensus. So it was like, okay, great. Um, but it, you know, it, 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 it brings up an interesting scenario that I don't currently have to navigate, but I have had to navigate in the past. It's been a while. It's been, you know, a decade or more since I've been found myself in that, like, uh oh, what have I, what have I, have I bitten off more than I should be able to chew kind of thing. It's, it reminded me of our conversation with Kenny Aronoff a couple of years ago where he was like, I just say yes to every gig. And then I, I say, we'll figure it out. But the reality is, you know, when Fogarty calls, he has to cancel other gigs. It's just how it works, <laughs> you know, and I, I don't like I, I, I didn't I didn't want to have to be in that position. And, and I don't have to be like it's it's I think it's going to work out great. But like I'm I, I, I started thinking about what do I need? Like, what would that look like just as an intellectual exercise? And uh, I started thinking of you. Right. Because you've got. You've got the house rockers, but a lot of people in the house rockers have like their own, I'll call them side projects, but really they're just other bands that they play in. And the house rockers is one of them. How do you guys navigate that? Do you have like a, a policy about how you like work that? Cause that's 10 people like, you know, bitter pill is six, maybe seven people. Now fling is five people, you know, in two bands, I've got only a little more than you have in one band to coordinate. And so that's a lot to try and navigate. How do you guys, do you have a policy? Like how, how do you deal with that? I, I, he, he asks innocently, although I realize. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a heavy question. And, and, you know, as I've shared, you know, my band has gone through some changes because I moved away. We were a band that played. Right. Right. Especially in the summer, every weekend. Right. And now we don't play every weekend. And so guys, Musicians are going to fill their time. Um, we actually have not had a good conversation about, about what's the right way to approach this. And, and it's a conversation that should happen because, well, well two things. Again, there's not, there's, there's not one prescription for, for all groups. You no. know, if you're a band, yeah, of course. if you're a band that, you know, constantly has subs and, you know, you're not a band I built my band really trying to highlight the participants on it and trying to you yeah. know, build an audience by getting to know the people in the band. And it's so frustrating when a, when a guy would sub himself for whatever reason, and someone will say, Hey, I came to see so-and-so. Why isn't he here today? That's a, that's a risk in that type of business scenario. Right. And it took me a long time to kind of, you know, especially with my horn to let them know, no, 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 you're in a band. You're not, you're not a gun for hire. You're in a band. Yeah. And here's what all of that means. So that, so that's one part of it, but other people, their business model is I'm, uh, you come to see me and you know, like, like Elvis, like, yeah, some people know who it was Elvis's backup band, but, but in general, if there was a different, you know, drummer, you know, the only people who would be bummed out would be drummers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm reminded of of Sting in his Bring on the Night movie, which is just a fantastic video because it or movie because it was created because Sting thought he was forming his next band. And wouldn't it be cool to document the process of forming a band? Nobody ever does that. You, you know, you don't think yeah. to do that. Well, I mean, it it became a band of people that played with Sting on his solo career, right? Like it didn't actually work out as a, a band band, although they played right. well together. But there was, yeah, there was a moment in that where I, I don't even think it was Sting. I think it was like one of Sting's managers or whatever was sitting down with Branford and Marsalis and said, hey, look, you know, uh, 
if you can't it, like, let's not lose sight of who the most important person on stage is. Cause if you can't make the gig, we can still open the doors. But if sting can't make the gig, right. we have to refund all the tickets. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the oh. business model that you have informs the type of conversation that sure. you have, but my business model is we're a band and, you know, I want, people to connect with everybody in our band and, you know, feel a connection, you know, to what we do. That's how we've grown our audience base and our mail list. And that's enabled many types of gigs for us. It is an approach. It's not everybody's approach. I get that. So in my band to directly answer your question, the conversation really hasn't happened. Like, all right, you know, that's not surprising. uh, Yeah. I'm not, I'm not there. And, uh, you know, but you know, I, I'm going to book this and, and I've delivered exactly what I promised I would book. I, I, I set out the weekends that I asked them to hold. I filled those weekends. You know, what I promise is what I have, which is the level one of it. Sure. However, you know, there is this thing about as guys, when you've built a band that is, you know, gets a reputation and all types of things, when, when things pull at the energy of that, which is a natural thing that was going to happen here when, when the guys, were in, their time was going to now get to be filled. Some guys formed other bands. Some guys take sub gigs. Some guys, you know, do solo things, sure. whatever it is. I think the biggest thing is... Work, working musicians are, are likely work. to continue finding work. That's right. Yeah. Okay. That said, and, you know, two things are in my ear right now. One is what you just shared about Sting. And the other thing is they're thinking back to... You know the 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 show we did with Shannon, right? It, you know, there's a business aspect to this that you know I have to get my hands around. And me having come to the realization, my brain is more the business guy than the art guy. Um, I think about well, what needs to happen is that you know in order to continue this thing to the level of success it is, people should make decisions. And understand, or at least consider, the effect it's going to have on the band they play in, right? So, you know, Branford Marsalis takes a, a, a another gig. This is not going to surprise people. He's an entity unto himself, right? right. Nobody's right. going to say, hey, you know, Sting, is your band still together? But I will actually get a question every now and then saying, boy, you know, so-and-so seems like he's playing a lot. Are the house rockers still together? And that that kills me. That, well, that's a, I, and for, that's well, first, the, what the absence of this conversation has yielded to some effect that I got to figure out how to get my hands around because that's not a slope I want to go down. So I'm sorry that that's happening. Cause that <laughs> su- no, it sucks, but it's interesting, especially with the sting thing. And I, I mean, obviously I realize we're talking about different levels of, of the, right. of the, the pay scale. Uh, but your goal to make the house rockers into a band that features the band and not Paul Kent and the house rockers, right. Or Paul Kent's house rockers, like it clearly very intentional. You said so, but it's also clear by people asking that question that it worked. Like you were successful in I'd say so. showing this image. Well, it definitely, because if, you know, if, it, if you were unsuccessful and everybody saw the house rockers as Paul's band with whomever he has, then somebody playing somewhere else doesn't change that. It's like, are the, is, is Sting still a performing musician just because he doesn't play, hasn't played with Branford Marsalis in, you know, 20 years or whatever it is? The answer is absolutely yes. You know, Vinny Kaliuta is no longer in Sting's band. It's Josh Freeze, another great drummer. But, you know, the fact that Vinny's not available for Sting or Sting hasn't hired Vinny, I don't know what, how that transpired, but... You know, it doesn't mean that Sting's not going to go on tour. In fact, Sting is currently on tour. So it's an interesting thing. Like you really have as much as, you know, we've talked seven years. You talk about the House Rockers as a leader led band and they, they you know, you clearly are. And, it, you know, you pulled it together and, and effectively you've been the driving force of it. People see it as a band and that's an important thing. And, and that's a there's a. There's a shared responsibility for that amongst the entire band, right? I this mean, is it, where that. Well, this is where the Shannon conversation comes in because it, yes, yeah, there, exactly. Implied there is, but but right, musicians <laughs> being musicians will you know kind of see like 
oh, I'm a solo artist now, you know, so I'm going to be judicious about how I dole out, you know, the house rockers are one of many things that, that some of my guys do now. Yeah. It's good when we're together. I mean, you know, it's fun and everybody likes playing with each other and, you know, it serves a point. I I can't tell whether whether that feeling of when we do get together is just such a nice reunion. Huh. That feels to me a little bit like we're watering down the mission. And for so many years, it was a mission, you know, a mission to get better gigs, bigger gigs, better right. pay. Right. And we're all on the same page and we're all contributing, you know, fairly similarly to that. Um, and uh, I, str- I struggle. I don't know if anybody else in the band struggles with it, but I struggle with what maintaining control of what it will become. Yep. I don't know that I'm willing to just organically let it become whatever it is. And then we all show up to the gig and, you know, still kick ass and, you know, everything's great. Sure. I, that would not be the way, way my brain is wired. I don't know about you, but, but that, you know, I work so hard to cultivate a, a, an image and a brand. Yeah. I, I don't know that I'm willing to let it go up to the, up to the, the gods and, you know, see what they return back to me. It, it's interesting. Cause that's effectively what happened with fling, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, I, I, I certainly, I know I've shared with you privately, but also I, I, I know I've shared on this show publicly that I wasn't sure if fling would survive the, the, you know, the lockdown, the, you know, the whole pause that we as musicians mm-hmm. had to see because of, of all the pandemic stuff. And, there were many times when we got together as fling to play here as, as things started sort of emerging uh, and, and the lockdown was, was less and less where it felt like a reunion. And I, I really will say that today's rehearsal was the first time in a long time that it did not feel like a reunion. Mm. Yeah. I like, I like it wasn't until you said that, did it put it in perspective for me? This was a rehearsal. We had a gig two weeks ago, which we talked about, or maybe three weeks ago, which we talked about on the show. It went really well. As I said, we've got a gig coming up this weekend. We actually have one the next weekend too. So we get two gigs uh, out of Aaron this, this month instead of just the one. But, um, but today's rehearsal was just a functional rehearsal. You know, the five of us got here and we worked on some stuff. We played through the things we needed to play through. We talked about, you know, some navigating some things for the set that, that's coming up over the next two gigs. And that was it. Uh, you know, it was, I mean, it, I say that was it. It was awesome. Like we had a great rehearsal, but it didn't feel like, Hey, it's so nice to see everybody. Cause we'd seen each other within, you know, the last couple of weeks, which for us is a whole lot more frequent than, than we have been, you know? So I like we, it, I guess in a sense, we did leave it up to the gods, sort of. Mm. I mean, there's been some intention and, and drive. And I give Russ Miles, our, our guitar player, one of our guitar players and our, our fearless uh, leader, if there is one of Fling, uh, a lot of credit for keeping the flame alive. But yeah, but it like it worked like we just we just got together and rehearsed. It was amazing. We loved it. So, yeah. So you could leave it up to the gods, but obviously you don't know what the outcome, like you kind of have to be ready for, for any outcome and including the ones oh. you can't predict. I don't know that you want. Yeah. Yeah. That. yeah. yeah. Remember fling fling was more democratic than the house rockers are. Mm. Right. And so I have a hundred percent still is, you know, yeah. Russ is yeah. our, Russ is our, our benevolent dictator when necessary, but for the most part that that's just not a thing. Like there's a division of, labor and fling and we all do different things and everybody has an input. Everybody has veto power. Everybody. It, yeah, it's, yeah. 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 It's, di- it's different for sure. Yeah. And, and this is where I often hold up the decisions I've made with the band. You know, I wanted to be in a band, but I wanted, you know, and I felt that a plan that I had and it wasn't, a, it, it felt like the right thing to do. Like, yeah. I, you know, it felt like a band, it's just something that can mean something to people. Right. But, you know, me being me, you know, I couldn't weigh myself down into the democratic process of, you know, of, you know, resolving disputes and, you know, you know sharing them over time, as I've shared many times, you know, like repertoire, those types of things. I, I, you know, changed path, check myself, you know, in the interest of keeping the whole thing going. But at the end of the day here, um, I find that the that of the nine other band, if I include Bill Ten, yep. there is a wide variety of perspectives about how to weight priorities moving forward. 
some of it concerning, some of it really comforting. I mean, there's the, you know, I have a relationship with some guys who are out doing other things now. One guy in particular who bends over backwards to let me know that, yes, I'm getting involved with some other stuff, but the house rockers are still incredibly important to me. You know, as long as we can manage our schedules together, I'll always tell you where I am, but I'm all in on the house rockers. It means a lot to me. And there's other guys who are, you know, out exploring the space, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're out <laughs> figuring out they're out. And, 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 and the reality is if that space gets to be more attractive than the house rockers, it's a very much easier yeah. leap than before when the house rockers, you know, were the, were the hottest ticket in town, I guess. Right. Sure. Um, but you know, this is the thing, 23 years, you know, we're together now and you know, we've gone through a lot of changes. We've changed a lot of people. We've, we've weathered a lot with COVID, you know, we, we've weathered yeah. a lot of things. And, but, and now me being farther away and just the foundational thing was, if you want to have a successful band, keep them working, right. You know, keep, keep stuff on the schedule. So people are focused on your project, not other projects that is changed now. And the effects of that change, uh, I'm trying to figure out, you know, it's not all bad. I mean, again, everybody, nobody has indicated to me that they're not a house rocker anymore. Nobody's right. But, you no, know, I get it. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm observing human nature take over here and there's, there's, space and work fills the, sp the space that you give it. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, this is, um, well, I, 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 I didn't realize <laughs> we have this phrase we use at, at work all the time where we say, well, have you heard from that client in a while? Maybe somebody that's, you know, just on like an auto renew monthly recurring revenue, a wonderful thing. Have you heard from that client in a while? And if the answer is no, it's like, okay, you got to get on the phone with them because, you know, you don't know what's going on. And, we, and we've solved this for the most part. But years ago, you know, we we called those phone calls where it had been a while as the let's pick up a rock and find out if there's a snake under it. And I, I feel like I did a little bit of that today. I, I picked up a rock and, and did not quite realize what was underneath it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so thank you for, 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 for trusting me uh, with that. I didn't really mean to put you on the spot, but. Uh, well, I mean, it's what we do here. I mean, I'm just trying to yeah. be honest, Yeah. you know, and respect. And that's the, that's the net net of this is like, I do respect the guys. I do get, I get that they are going to fill space with other things. If I was, if they listen to this, the one thing I hope that, that they would hear, and I, you know, should that you asked me, have we had a conversation or do we have any rules right. around this? Yeah, that's all I asked. The one thing I think, <laughs> yeah. yes, thanks Dave. <laughs> the one thing I would say is if you are a musician, you're doing multiple things, respect all of them, like, like including the, you know, including the ones, you know, that may be your side gig now or, yeah. you know, whatever is changing, communicate with the leader, you know, be honest about your availability, be honest about your commitment, all those types of things. I think that's a really fair thing for a two-way conversation. So the leader can make the best decisions for the band, yeah. you know, in, in an interest to keep the project moving forward. So Things change. People's lives change. You know, people have babies, people get married, people move. People, you know, there's a whole bunch of life changes that get in the way of, of, of having a band have a good long run. Right. Yes. Oh, I, I mean, communication is the communication is the essence and respect, respect the value that, you know, the projects that you are, you know, offer not only you, but you know, what they mean to the, your local listening public. And yeah. right? I built a brand that means something to people. We need to be caretakers of that. Y y yes, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. That's right. Yeah. And, and like Timothy B. Schmidt said, yeah, every band is on the verge of breaking up at all times. I mean, <laughs> like, well, but it's, a, it, you know, it's a, it's a nice little catchphrase, but it has the added benefit of truth. It, you know, there, you do need to take care of the glue that holds it together, whatever that glue is. And it's, it, it can and often could be democracy is very could, could be a benevolent yeah. dictator, whatever it is, you know, you should know what it is. You should and, know what it is. That's it. And just like really acknowledge, Oh, this is, this is what it is. This is what works to keep this band together. So let's all commit to whatever that, you know, our part in that is. Yeah. Yeah, yep. man. Exciting. Well, I hope, I hope it works out for all of us. I, I mean, I, I say that, but I, you know, there's so many things in my life that I have hoped would go one way and have gone another. And in sure. the end have worked out very well. It, it's, it's that whole, you know, everything happens for a reason philosophy. I, I don't tend to throw caution to the wind and, and just throw my, uh, you know, 
th- throw the dice into the, the hands of fate. But uh, sometimes it works out that way anyway, despite my most control freakish, uh, uh, you know, intentions. <laughs> we get it. So, yeah. Yeah. Fun. Well, that was good gig therapy, gig gab therapy, which is really what this whole show started as for us. So here we are. It's nice to uh, nice to chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Onward. You got anything else for uh, for us here today? <laughs> no, I'm going to go cry in the that, corner. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was your day? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I love your that whole the the combating the first set blues. You, you, you I, I don't know if you've ever said that before, but that there is there's a lot of truth to that for all of us. So that's I like. It's that. fun when we when we come across something that. When I say it or you say it and the light bulb goes on and we know that a bunch of listeners are going to hear that type of thing. So we usually get a good amount of email when, when we kind of come up with a, yeah. a good summation of something we're all going through. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right, folks. Well, as much as I love doing this, it, it feels like it is time to end. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Always be performing, Dave. I will. I'll do my darndest. Atta boy. <laughs> you too, huh? Yeah. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Perform in our email for us, please. We'd love it. <laughs>